So, um, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. Some of you, uh, for, for some, with some of you, I've shared like this whole week of uh, discussions and uh, very, very intense debates um, and very fruitful discussions. Some of you I see for the first time. Um, this is the last uh, final panel roundtable of our Contesting Authoritarianism Perspectives from the South conference um, entitled Beyond Authoritarianism, Counter Strategies, Solidarities, Utopias, um, where we will discuss on exactly this issue of um, going beyond authoritarianism. Just uh, so you get the context a bit, like we have been um, meeting here since as part of the International Research Group on uh, Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies. Um, we've been um, together, working together for the last two, two years more or less. Uh, we were very close to meeting for the first time in early 2020. And then pandemic came um, and it actually um, has been the first moment where the whole group, which has about a little more than 20 researchers um, from uh, scholar activists from countries of the so-called global south. We all agree that we don't like this uh, notion, but um, that we actually could come together. And I think this, uh, this getting together, this gathering in a very joyful um, mode and a very yeah, way of, 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 of concrete uh, discussions in solidarity, um, being together, enjoying being together has been a very, um, yeah, I don't know, empowering and beautiful experience. Um, so, um, we, we entitled this conference Contesting Authoritarianism and there is of course the question uh, which will accompany us um, also today of what contesting means. Um, we discussed this also on our first panel with Alex Demirovic, Hugo Fanton and Zeynep Gambetti, um, where Alex said like contesting for him is also very much about critical thinking, about about um, opposing something to the profound stupidity and blindness of the of the of the dominant class and of the against like the cold heartedness of um, the current given moment, so to say. Um, and I think contesting also, of course, means a lot more. Um, it means tackling with the ideology, the neoliberal authoritarian um, ideology of what Zeynep Gambetti called like survivalism, of what Michael Hirsch and some panel called like the bad life based on self-sacrifice, of hard work, of carelessness, a very profound carelessness and even like resentment and hate towards um, towards others, but also towards ourselves. And I think this is also a very important issue that we have to reflect on. We are thinking authoritarianism not as a regime question, but as a question of, let's say, governmentality, as a question, as a mode of living, as a question um, that in this sense um, runs through us, although it does so in a very, very specific and of course, very differentiated ways. Um, it's not only like located in political institutions and so on, it's located in infrastructures, for instance, we've been discussing work conditions, platform work. Um, it's of course like part of institutions. It is embedded in bodies and minds, um, as I said, in a very specific ways. And we've started our discussions um, parting from a notion of crises, um, like um, a crisis which in Latin America is termed in like a crisis of civilization. We've discussed the notion of multiple crises. I think um, we agree that there's an experience and a profound feeling that is shared not only by us who like uh, discuss authoritarianism, but in very broad sense by many people, um, the notion of crisis, of things falling apart, but a crisis also um, of uh, our possibilities and capacities to imagine other futures and other ways of living. Um, there's like a, 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 with this commodification and this colonization, um, neoliberal colonization um, of livelihood, of times and spaces, of our very uh, intimate um, lives. Um, there's also like this yeah, kind of Im impossibility to, to, to imagine other futures. And I think this um, feeling like of helplessness 
you know, of not knowing where to go is something that um, is shared in a way um, by the dominant and the dominated in very different ways, of course, like completely in, in this sense, not com um, comparable, but there is like, as Alex has mentioned in the, in the first panel we were, like um, a, a, a profound, yeah, what I said, like the stupidity and not knowing and, and not non-consensus non of the dominated of how to go this, on, uh, how to go on. And this um, also from our side, there has been, um, let's say difficulties of, of imagining, or we are imagining in many different ways, like how we can get out of this and invent another life. Um, so the very like uh, bad response or bad answer, the false solution to this is like a kind of weaponized neoliberal um, exploitation on the territories, on housing, um, on the bodies and uh, lives, um, on emotions in many different ways. So, um, but this doesn't mean that there's no contestations. And I think this is a very, very important um, issue that has been come up, the in very intersectional ways, um, how concrete struggles actually work. We've heard about the Brazilian urban movements who have been um, organizing against the genocidal politics of, of Bolsonaro during the crisis. We've heard of worker struggles. We've heard of, of, of psychoanalysts in Brazil um, forming like uh, in the favelas, um, psychologists to do like really political and psychological groundwork there. We've heard about um, the struggles going on in the culture and music and so on and so forth in the housing um, and in the urban sphere where concrete um, other ways of living together and being together have, have been um, built up. And this is where we actually want to focus on today. Um, I think we are not inventing something, but we are reflecting upon how struggles um, actually already speak and sometimes in a very like organic or natural way if we if we wouldn't know that there's so much work and so much things behind it um, speak together i was just remembering during our great film program that nafise and berge have curated in the cinema uh, transtopia um, we just saw everything must fall a film on the um, struggles against the um, fees and student fees in, um, in South Africa, where post-colonial struggles, um, feminist struggles, and the anti-neoliberal struggles um, just came together and fall to, fell together in one, one place. Um, and I think the idea of utopias, of concrete utopias, is something that we have also um, heard and seen um, in many panels and many discussions that we're having, which is something that is happening in the movements, in the um, in the housing struggles, in many collectives all over the world. So, um, I just want to say before we start with this panel, thanks to um, many, many people who made this conference possible. Um, first of all, of course, all my comrades and colleagues from the IRGAG, because this has been a collective process of um, organizing this conference. Um, the people have um, proposed the panels, proposed the topics, and this has been like a, a very decentralized way of organizing a conference with people all over the globe. So thank you very, very much to all of you. I also want to uh, thank all the people who are like um, taking care of the infrastructure here of Luma Park, who's doing the um, filming, Malte, Lu, Marco, of the caterers who gave us like, uh, who brought us and cooked us and prepared us great food all this time, um, to all the uh, staff that's been around um, doing all this concrete care work for every uh, conference. Um, Tom, Diego, Tiziana, Emma, Deriva, Daniela, Kiel, Katerin, I don't know who's here. Um, the crew for the Anarche, because on uh, Thursday we did a fantastic raft trip, critical city tour through Berlin um, with this um, great collective project. Um, and also to Al Berlin, I don't know who of you is here, and Bibak. Uh, Al Berlin are the ones with whom we are doing the party tonight. I hope you registered and will be there starting nine o'clock. And a very special thanks to Gustavo and Jan David, very specially, who has been organizing all of this um, together with me. So thank you. And uh, 
let's start with this discussion. So my first, um, thanks. So my first um, question, um, or my first invitation, was that the um, people, which I will present uh, one by one afterwards, um, speak us a bit about how the specific amalgam of authoritarianism um, is being like lived, experienced, perceived within their context and how their struggles um, like adapt or are like part of this um, specific way of authoritarian. I would start like just with you, Union, and then going over to here. So um, we decided to keep presentation short. Union is a feminist researcher currently at the University of Oslo. Thank you so much for being here and please. Thank you. Uh, I have five minutes, so I'll be brief. So um, we are asked to define authoritarianism in our own particular context. I think that's a very valuable practice because there's no one single kind of authoritarianism. And we have to remember that authoritarian regimes or institutions or way of, of ways of governing does not, um, is not born out of vacuum. It feeds on to specific historical, cultural, political context. And each way, each kind of authoritarianism has has, it dates back to quite a few decades before and even sometimes a century. So in the case of China, um, it's one of the biggest authoritarian regime in the world, I guess. It's definitely worth kind of paying attention to. And we all know through its economic takeoff, it's exerting enormous amount of power to the entire world through the One Belt, One Road scheme, through its investment in Africa, Latin America, its buying off all the Greek ports. The economic power also grants its political influence that its institutions can spread. So I'd like to define authoritarian China in uh, uh, at least four to five different kind of ways. The first way is, of course, most um, the most obvious, uh, the so-called authoritarian institutions. So um, it is not a um, single kind of communist regime that you imagine to be, say, Soviet Union kind of regime. I would argue it's quite a hybrid of the Confucian paternalistic ruling, meaning the parents are acting as the parents of the citizens. And it's often used as a metaphor to say, we are taking care of our children slash citizens. A hybrid of that with a long history, of course, of communist, Leninist, one-party state. Uh, and that's coupled with the institution of uh, different levels of power concentration, uh, concentration, depends on the era. China has had relatively more decentralized power um, divisions within the Politburo within the party uh, structure, uh, especially in the previous rule under President Hu. Uh, and since she's coming into power, I would argue in the last decade, we see more and more concentrated power. And nowadays, it's also coupled with the use of digital technologies. So some um, scholars and analysts even call it a digital Leninism, Leninist regime, which civilians is prevalent, censorship is also heavily used. So those kind of institutions, of course, can be used to describe how the Chinese authoritarian regime is functioning within its state institutions. But I want to um, bring out more the cultural aspect of how an authoritarian regime can be played out. So the so-called frame of mind. I think some of you have mentioned that authoritarian regimes tend to othering uh, different kind of outsiders. And that's a, um, a practice we often uh, see being uh, used to justify certain actions, to justify certain policies. And the we and them kind of um, differentiation has been central to um, class struggle in general. So it has been central to not only authoritarian regimes, but many different kind of left-wing political struggles. The fact that um, capitalists against proletarian or the exploiters against the exploited. It's not specific to China, but we have to acknowledge it's a common practice to categorize people as the enemy and the enemy of the people needs to be eliminated or somehow silenced or put away. So that's basically the politics of fear because uh, 
when you portray your enemy as uh, powerful, as scary, as terrifying, then of course, emotionally, you can justify to your citizens that that's uh, what we need to do to them. So that's the second kind of way I thought we should um, pay attention to. And the third would be the so-called language. Uh, language is an important aspect of constructing the authoritarian regime because the new speech is the way how our brains is structured in the authoritarian regime. So communist uh, kind of terminologies such as the mass, uh, the people, uh, the class enemy uh, are often, of course, used in Mao era to, uh, to, def to, to create categories in people's minds. But nowadays, uh, Chinese regime also uses, uh, kind of reinvent words such as democracy and human rights and ter terrorism and counterterrorism as in the way that they find convenient. Um, for example, um, the actions in Xinjiang, the re-education camps, is actively adopting US style counter-terrorist kind of discourse to justify extremism need to be cleaned out and re-educated. Um, and I've done some research on how Chinese citizens understand democracy, and it's interesting to see how they have very different way, uh, ways to define democracy. They tend to define that a good government, an efficient government, it's democracy. It doesn't matter you're elected or you have multiple parties, it only matters you deliver results. And that's of course result of years and years of reinventing those new speech. So fourth category I thought about is knowledge and the limitation of uh, and limited access to knowledge and filtered knowledge through censorship. It's quite easy point to understand that through a massive uh, kind of censorship um, and limitation to certain disciplines or certain discussions or certain groups of voices, people do not have access to history, to um, discussions that are happening uh, globally and to the kind of activism they are engaging in that we can mention later, which um, feminist activism can talk a lot about that. So the last point is the coalition with neoliberalism. So with the Chinese case, I think it's a bit tricky to define China as a typical neoliberal country because state presence and state intervention is prevalent. I mean, it's almost opposite because state intervention is everywhere, in every com uh, company, in every neighborhood, in everyday life. In a way, it's, mm, it's strong regulation, uh, economically and socially. But in the, in the other sense, the embrace of global capitalism also makes Chinese society very much focusing on individual competition. I'm a direct victim that I, I, we, um, our generation thinks we have to have the best of in, in everything. And uh, it's all about making kind of a successful individual. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I know it's little time, but we'll have more time afterwards to go dig in deeper into this. Um, thank you. And so we get to you, Damir. Damir is an author, activist, and psychoanalyst from uh, Tuzla, Bosnia. Um, welcome so much, uh, Damir, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, I'll actually have to start from Bosnia and Herzegovina currently being a, a typical neoliberal country and actually maybe at the forefront of neoliberalism. And why is that so? Because Bosnia and Herzegovina currently is marred by what I call terror of peace, right? There is this false choice being given uh, to, to Bosnian citizens. You either accept the neoliberal peace agreement, or it's going to be reverting back to the war. So this kind of structure completely continues the wartime logic and continues the production of wasted human lives and, and wasted human um, relationships. But in order for us to kind of understand wherein comes this um, neoliberal precept of, of it's either this kind of peace or it's back to uh, complete destruction. We have to completely rewrite and, and think a new um, 
something that's been a blind spot uh, uh, for political philosophy, uh, political theory, and that is uh, the position of Yugoslavia. Why has Yugoslavia been a blind spot in the, in the leftist thinking as well? Because of two things in particular. Yugoslavia was a very particular experiment in the abolishment of private property. And this is something that, that I cannot emphasize enough. So Yugoslavia produced a very particular type of social bond in relation to the socially owned property that had nothing to do with public-private division. It had its own uh, logic and mechanism. So when the war, um, when Yugoslavia was actually pushed into, into transition into capitalism and it was um, kind of dissolved throughout the 80s as the result of the global crisis of capitalism and then uh, violently uh, dismembered um, in the war on genocide, um, it, it was to achieve only two things, expropriation of society and expropriation of property. And that's the limit today for any sort of leftist thinking because we cannot think about the left unless we think about the abolishment of private property. Everything else cannot be called a um, leftist property. So today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, it is useful for me to think about this neoliberal peace and the authoritarian aspects of it in this triad of, of, of governance models. So there is the triad of insecurity, poverty, and trauma that's been mobilized to produce very particular types of subjectivities that are not only kind of docile, subjects to the market and are accepting the lowest paid jobs or are exported as the best workers to service American wars, for instance, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but, or they are farmed to Germany, actually, to come as, as, as cheap labor and you know, leaving, leaving the society completely destitute. But more importantly, Bosnia and Herzegovina functioning as a very particular zone of exception, being surrounded by the countries of the EU, is now forced in this new wave of people on the move and the migration to actually accept and, and house people um, and, and migrants uh, who are then using Bosnia and Herzegovina to try to re-enter the EU and um, actually t being also um, exercising solidarity with the people on the move when they're beaten up at the borders of the EU and, and, and sent back. So, so the, the, the question is, how do we pierce through this cons perpetual production of victimhood, traumatized subjectivities, deep impoverishment, Poverty in Bosnia and Herzegovina was up until recently standing at around 30-40%. The, the um, unemployment of young people uh, in particular was you know, dropped from 60% to around 45%. So the figures are very dismal. But rather than actually thinking why this little country um, exists, you know, why is it just a problem or, you know, kind of recasting the problems in terms of ethnicity. I think it's, it's more interesting to think about it in, in terms of um, what kind of neoliberal models and strategies of governance are produced and tested in Bosnia and Herzegovina as the lab for, for um, these kind of new shock doctrines, but also to recast and think uh, this this um, legacy uh, of, of socially owned property and the types of the embolishment of, of the private property that produced significant ef effects, not only in Yugoslavia, but elsewhere that, you know, which, which led to the possibility of thinking, you know, alternatives to the bipolarity, such as the non-lined movement, et cetera, et cetera. So. Thank you very much, Damir, for these very, very interesting insights. Um, and so, um, to Harsh, to Harsh Mender, he's an author and activist. Um, he's currently in Berlin, residing in Berlin as a Robert Bosch um, Fellow. At the and he's also um, working still at the Center for Equity Studies in India. Welcome, Harsh, and thank, to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, 75 years ago, um, when India chose, uh, just after 
cast off its colonial bondage. Uh, it chose universal franchise. Um, it seemed to many an audacious decision in a country of such immense poverty and uh, illiteracy. Um, uh, but not just universal suffrage, but also a country that would be inclusive, egalitarian, uh, where people of every faith, every identity would have equal rights and equal citizenship. Um, the first decades, there were problems, but there was also a lot of hope. Uh, but what we see today is a very fast, uh, very worrying collapse of of, of many of those, or most of those dreams and pledges uh, that were part of our freedom struggle, uh, that was central to our constitution. The rest of the world doesn't seem to be paying enough attention. Uh, but I think we're entering uh, a very dark place. And uh, in just the five minutes I have, I'll try to talk a little bit about what are the major threats I liked what you said was in the beginning that when we're talking about authoritarianism, we're not just talking about the state, but also about a way of life. And I think that is what is uh, falling apart. One part of it is, uh, you know, which is very visible, is the crushing of dissent. And uh, we're seeing the use of anti-terror laws um, for putting away uh, uh, largely young voices, but uh, others, intellectuals who speak about equity and, uh, and uh, secular values. Um, and there's, uh, you know, th there's uh, fear and a rapid uh, uh, kind of self-censorship of large segments of civil society, academia, the media, uh, even political parties. Uh, and so that's, that's I think, uh, uh, a second. And many of us who still try to raise our voices are charged with all kinds of crimes. But I think that perhaps the biggest marker of, of what is falling apart in our country is the, is the notion of uh, an egalitarian uh, solidarity between people of different faiths and identities. And, uh, and uh, we're seeing most dramatically, uh, almost the state at war with its um, Muslim minorities. And we're talking about 200 million people uh, in our country. Every day, uh, you know, there's a mobilization uh, around and uh, there was lynching, there's runaway hate speech, uh, there are attacks on the way of life. And why it's also a way of life is that there's larger and larger segments uh, of uh, the majority Hindu community, which seems to be supporting uh, uh, what, what is happening. Uh, I see many worrying echoes with uh, what happened in Germany in the 1930s, uh, leading up to we know what. There's also a war against uh, informal labor. Uh, there, it was especially very dramatically visible during the pandemic, uh, where we saw millions of, of of workers, uh, in fact, the largest probably movement in human history of distress, about 30 million people just broke uh, the lockdown and walked hundreds of kilometers uh, to their homes, people dying on the streets because there was, uh, there was no planning, no social security. Neoliberalism is, you know, at a wider sense, displaying uh, its, its, its most worrying face. There's, open crony capitalism, there's virtually, you know, uh, joblessness, unemployment at, at its highest levels. Uh, there's uh, the state withdrawing from social provisioning uh, or you know, health care. 80% uh, of India's doctors, uh, incidentally, work only for the corporate sector, etc. So, uh, so I see that. I, I just... Uh, all of this is enabled, and you know, I, 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 I'll just end this presentation. You know, there are manifestations of the collapse of India's democracy. How does it? How has it happened? And I think all the institutions seem to, which were supposed to uh, hold the executive accountable, 
seem to have given way. Parliament, uh, the opposition is uh, ha, ha, has 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 grown very weak. We're seeing less and less of. We had a, we're very proud of a higher judiciary, uh, but we are seeing uh, them uh, not standing up. The media, uh, I, I must say a line about. We're seeing uh, the media not only you know reluctantly silenced, but actually cheerleaders of the hate campaign. Um, uh, much of the media, most of the media, and lastly, civil society itself. And I think that that was the last bastion of 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 opposition. I, you know, we'll talk. I think in the next round about, so uh, you know, uh, resistance that still exists, but large segments of civil society have also been silenced. Thank you, Harsh. Um and to you, Sabrina. Sabrina is uh, an eco-socialist communicator, research uh, research at the University of Brasilia. Um, and I should also say that Sabrina is part of the research group on authoritarianism and counter strategies. So welcome again <laughs> to you. Hello. Ah, good. Um, thank you. And it's an honor to be here representing my colleagues too from ERGEX. So thank you all for being such an amazing research group for the past years. Um, so within these five minutes, I just I wanted to pinpoint a couple of things that I think are quite important to understand, like these new wave of authoritarian uh, governments, actors, and discourses that we have in society today that we actually see in terms of like a lot of parallels in the global north, in the global south. Um, Obviously, the political economy is quite different. Uh, the geopolitical implications are quite different, but we also know that there are actors that are borrowing from others uh, in foreign states. We know there are interventions taking place as well. So it's important to try to um, understand these parallels a little. One thing that has become quite clear for us over the past years is that a lot of these news, new actors, they, well, they come in with authoritarian ideas um, they want to have authoritarian practices, but they might get elected in, you know, a democratic system. Obviously, we will we'll have to um, bring in, open a little bracket here and say that, for example, if we have a lot of, a lot of fake news and we, if we have these um, system mainly used through the Internet to take away the credi uh, credibility of elections and things like that, we might say, well, maybe it's not that democratic, but there's the appearance is there, right? So for example, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, as bad as he is, a lot of his supporters just say, well, but we voted for him, the majority of Brazilians voted for him, so that brings legitimacy. And to understand that, we need to understand that these guys have managed to present themselves as anti-systemic when a lot of the left forgot how to do it. Um, perhaps because of infighting, because of fragmentation within the left itself, or just because they thought that, well, we heard that thing about there is no alternative, like in the beginning of the 90s, and so there is no alternative, so we'll just keep playing along with this. And then there come like the far right, and they say, no, there is an alternative, and it's us. Um, and obviously that's a huge lie because what they're doing is not providing an alternative, but they're deepening the problems we, that we already see in this system to the point that you get to, to um, a fascist outcome. Something else that they use, like I mentioned, fake news, a um, whole range of denialism. So we see scientific denialism that could be in terms of the pandemic, in terms of climate change, for example, but even in the way that things uh, work. So Coming back to the point of elections, um, for, uh, again, in Brazil, but we saw this with Trump in the United States as well, looking to well, how the ballot box system works and saying, well, this is not fair. So we're going to promote uh, this big distrust in society and say, well, this is not working. So we need recount or Bolsonaro was trying to um, bring back paper ballots instead of the um, electronic ballot that we have in Brazil because of this, because it's, it was a way of saying, well, we're, we're promoting this denialism uh, around how the system works, even though the legislative, um, if, for example, like the people in Congress who were with Bolsonaro in this, they got elected through that system. 
So it creates this huge confusion because it is democratic when we win, but it's not democratic when we lose. And that's because it's not just about the denialism and the fake news, it's about a severe state of depoliticization where you mess up with the meanings of things. And Yujun was talking a little bit about this. So we also have this case, um, you know, with the far right doing this, you know, changing the meaning of democracy when people were saying that they were democratically asking for the military to take over. Uh, or that, well, we want the uh, intervention society like in the military dictatorship in Brazil, there was um, some uh, particular interventions from the dictatorship and one of them was, uh, was the AI-5 and there were people on the streets uh, in Brazil asking for the AI-5 to be back, which was a huge state of like persecuting people, censorship, uh, putting people in jail, criminalizing in general. Uh, that has happened in terms of when we're talking about freedom and human rights as well in the sense of saying, well, human rights for the right humans. So this is obviously a very like racist, fascist tendency See, and it comes with a lot of conservatism as well, which is another point that we need to emphasize because authoritarianism is really going after the rights of women, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities, uh, and appropriating territory of like traditional uh, black, former slave communities, indigenous communities. This is all very much present. And then there's the role of the internet in, uh, the internet in this, making things go a lot faster. So this presents us with a particular challenge uh, that we have this job of like identifying these actors, tendencies, narratives, um, particular discourses and governments because as we have found out, authoritarianism comes in many ways. Uh, so it's not that strict, it's not always that easy to pinpoint. Um, but when we do that, it's not enough to just analyze them. We need to ask like who's gaining with this? was actually gaining with this. And when we ask that question, we go back to the political economy point, and then we find out that, well, a lot of people who are gaining with this are the same people from before that sometimes position themselves as liberal and non-authoritarian. Because how convenient is it when you have, you know, these people like pushing things to like the very far right and get it so bad, and then you say, see, this is why you need to come back to the center and you need more moderation. And then we get stuck in this cycle forever that we go back to there is no alternative, we normalize the cycle, so we keep, uh, uh, we keep just on one side of things, and in that way it gets rid of our radical imagination. I think this is one of the worst outcomes that we have had like in the past years. Thank you, Sabrina. You managed to mention so many topics in such a short time. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. So um, to you, Eva. Um, Eva is philosopher, researcher, and writer um, from Germany, uh, living close by Berlin, I think. So welcome, Eva. Thank you. I'm so humbled and excited to be on this panel. And thank you all for, for showing up as well. It's amazing. Um, I think one great thing of this research project of yours, as, as far as I've followed it, is that it also pays a lot of attention on the kind of effective um, dynamic and the, the kind of drives behind, the death drives maybe, behind authoritarianism. And I actually mostly want to just make one little observation on a certain affective stance that I think is shared by a lot of authoritarian movements around the world, though we should discuss that, and I will only speak about a few instances from my very local and maybe even idiosyncratic context because that's that's where I observe at best. And the stance that I'm uh, I mean is something I call the defense of phantom possession, and it's a kind of frenzied possessiveness that to me seems to be at the center of a lot of authoritarian um, desire. One should say even though that possessiveness doesn't come anymore with the promise of participating in the riches. It's not a kind of um, future-oriented capitalist possessiveness. Actually, that possessiveness, I think, comes more with a promise of getting priority access to the destruction. And so when I came here today um, on the train, on the, through the slowly desertifying um, Brandenburg. So it has rained for the first time in seven weeks, but we like, it is like, literally slowly turning into a desert, this countryside. Um, 
I thought about the different versions of authoritarianism and fascism that I observe back there where I live, where actually, I mean, anyway, of course, queer communists, but every even moderate green liberal lefty is in the minority. And that's an interesting experience. It's an experience you don't really make in Berlin, but that we make out there, right? You have to cohabit with fascists. And they are like, we just had a last week regional election all the bourgeois parties like went for one social democratic candidate from the CDU to the Linke. That he won by 60%, but there were over 30% for three different Nazi parties. So the AfD, which we have in Germany as the right-wing party, had a good turnout, 11%, but there were two more radical Nazis. There was one who's just a kind of anti-corona conspiracy theorist. And then there was one guy who um, got 8% of the vote, who quit the NPD, which is our neo-Nazi party, because it's not right-wing enough. So. 10%, almost 10% of my neighbors who do vote, voted for that guy. So that's, that's the situation, right? And when observing um, the attitudes there, I think one thing that's very clear about contemporary fascism or Nazism, as opposed to the kind of past th European 30s fascism, is the post-neoliberal individualism. So the car is, of course, a very important expressive um, tool for <laughs> Nazis, so they always have the, the slogans on their cars. One slogan in, in the village next door is, my life, my rules. That could have been a left-wing attitude, right? But that's now at the core of the, the right-wing pride, of the white pride of the, the neo-Nazis. Um, it's funny, though, because they don't really, like they don't really have much that they can rule over in their lives, of course. This is a very destitute area. It's a kind of the hinterland of Berlin. But there seems to be in that right-wing project a promise to a certain kind of superiority or glory that you wouldn't otherwise like have. And so so what what is that even, right? What what is that um that um, possession that they have. And I think it becomes most clear also in the confrontation with the very little left resistance that there is. So f the other thing that happened politically last week there is that a f tiny forest occupation that doesn't really, really make it in the um, global like um, news in Germany at the moment, the, um, in Seefeld and the Altmark. I mean, it's like a few people living in forests to block a motorway. They, um, and they know already that it's not going to work. So that it's clear that the motorway, they've lost all the lawsuits, the motorway will be built. And also the motorway is proven by all the planning bureaus to not be necessary for anyone because the, um, the traffic there has halved over the last years. I mean, that's such an empty area. You don't even need a street, but there is one big military training area which needs the, um, the infrastructure and they're going to build an Amazon warehouse there because the labor is cheapest and they need the infrastructure. So, and it's not only the state with the police force that is kind of boxing through this project of building that motorway through the forest against the activist resistance, it's also the local fascist. So they go there and attack the, um, the left encampments in a way saying that their forest, their heimat, should rather be destroyed than defined as a future regenerative ecological space by the left. And one interesting thing is that in this in those neo-Nazi attacks, of course, the police always had the role of downplaying it. So several times um, they tried to set fire on the encampment and then the police always said, oh, no, no, you were not careful enough with, with your, your own, like, whatever, toaster. And then eventually the neo-Nazis there made a um, whole video of their attack where the, one of them was wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. So, and shooting with a gotcha gun onto the activist. And then that got the police kind of involved saying that, oh, here's a problem. And while they were in the camp saying that, oh, actually you need to um, evacuate the camp because your houses aren't safe. So they then thought the safety of the activists was uh, like endangered by their own structures and not by the Nazis who were trying to set fire on those structures. So that's, that's a bit the kind of landscape there where you have a, as a, almost like a militia alongside the police. And what do they do? They help implement 
the extractivism and the ecological destruction of the region, they are mostly not even going to gain. And I mean, even getting a job in an Amazon warehouse isn't much of a gain. But they have a fantasy of participating in that status of the one who can dispose over, um, over those resources, over that domain. And even though I now spoke mostly about the people in that region who are real have-nots, that attitude that you should have a kind of total sovereignty or kind of right to exert violence in a certain area is something that I also encounter when I take that train into Berlinian institutions in a um, much more kind of distinguished bourgeois guise. So one way in which there is a huge alliance in Germany between the kind of neo-Nazi discourse and respectable um, bourgeois discourse, especially at the university, is that the total um, hatred against all things to do with gender and feminism. And so if you try, as I have for some years when I was taking that train back and forth, to bring any type of proper feminism into a German philosophy department, mm -hmm. then you can see how, again, there is some kind of real, like, you, 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 dist you, as if you've broken through a fence into somebody's possession, right? In the department where I was working, there was, um, an initiative, so there was a colleague, not in our department, um, who has said lots of fascist things, invited fascists to speak, and then um, was called a fascist by the students, upon which the other philosophers discussed that one should have a petition to defend that poor guy's freedom of speech because it was kind of curtailed by him being called a fascist. So you have this massive individual fantasy of being allowed to do something destructive. It's not even to make a career or be, it's like just to use your standards of philosophy to talk down certain groups. And I think if we mm, want to patch together a bigger picture of authoritarianism today, then I think one of the currencies is the, the linking of those individual domains in which you can like enjoy destruction while continuing to deny that, of course, continuing fossil capitalism as we do in neoliberalism just means destroying the whole future horizon of life, right? And if you accept that as a reality to which there is no alternative, then the best bet you can get is that at least you have your share of that destruction and nobody else can intervene with that. And I think one, one big difference, of course, is whether that really is always an individual project or whether that's a collective project, right? So for instance, the Eurasian ideology driving Putin's imperialism is a collective phantom possession. And some of the fascism of the 30s also had like collective nationalist phantom possession of owning something together. Whereas the context that I now mentioned with the Brandenburgian neo-Nazi scene and the German or the Berlinian philosophy scene, <laughs> they have more this individual drive to defend one's phantasmatic entitlement against all things left and future oriented and tender and non-destructive. Thank you. Thank you for all your, your, your insights, your thoughts, um, um, which were, I found very, all very, very interesting. And I think um, also like when we hear it, we are, uh, me at least, maybe it's not happened to all of us, but we are left with the with we see like these family resemblances and these similarities, and at the same time, um, it's also like it's it seems to come like from many different contexts, and it's always and this is the problem about discussing global globalized authoritarianism. Like, how do we conceptualize? How do we think these different? Uh, how 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 this what we call either fascism, authoritarianism, or other ways, authoritarian populism, authoritarian neoliberalism, how does it actually take form, take shape in a concrete, um, in a concrete space? What I was thinking about now was that, um, like, authoritarian, what, what we call authoritarianism kind of wraps up many different um, issues that you touched, but in this negative sense, yeah? Like, we have, like, the anti-feminism, we have uh, the racism, yeah? we have the um, question of like a production of inequality like, and, and even like a kind of worshipping of 
inequality, like as of merit meritocracy, like a class hatred and so on. We have um, the struggles, like or the, the repression of um, knowledge that uh, Union talked about. We have the question of how um, rights, um, democratic rights for women, for um, black people, for poor people, for a lot of like, of course, different groups, but from the perspective of authoritarian practices, um, put in a sack of active uh, um, marginalization, so to say. Um, all of these things fall together in what we call authoritarianism, but I think it's for us always um, hard like to think how this falls together in a positive sense, like um, how we can think this from from a side which is not only opposing, like no, not only anti-authoritarianism, but going beyond, yeah? And thinking of it in, in, in positive terms. And this brings me just to one last remark before I get to you, which is, of course, there is, a, and Sabrina mentioned it, I think, uh, uh, you Horst, also the question of it is very important to defend rights. Yeah, we have to, and 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 several people made this claim. Like for the left, like the question of rights has been like some, you know, liberal whatever. Yeah, and it was like let's just uh, whitewashing everything. But now we see that when these rights are actually taken away, it's getting very ugly. So we have to defend these rights, I guess, but we have to also think of going beyond this. So um, this is my question to you. Um, where do you think like our counter strategies, but also in general, like our, our struggle should um, address what authoritarianism addresses? Because from all of you, I've heard it's not only just overthrowing the government, which is probably always a good idea to do, but it does not just not sufficient idea to do. So where do we have to intervene with our struggles and our strategies? I suggest we start again with you, Junyun. Thanks. Thank you for the question, uh, Boris. Um, I thought of a few uh, answers to your question. So I will use my own, um, the kind of fight I've picked from my life, which is feminism. Um, especially more like feminist di diaspora that lives outside of China and tries to uh, connect to um, issues that are relevant to Chinese women living in China and also to those who are uh, currently kind of, um, how to say, um, kind of, yeah, outside of our own country. So I think one uh, first thing that came to my mind as a very valuable counter strategy is to challenge the so-called uh, limitation on knowledge, knowledge that I mentioned as a, often used as a tool or instrument to shape our thinking. So uh, for feminist um, endeavors uh, in China, one important step we have taken is to first construct our own feminist knowledge. Of course, it, many knowledge have come from abroad. Uh, feminist groups have spent a lot of time trying to translate um, kind of work from uh, not only English, but in also similar post-socialist uh, regimes, such as in um, Poland, in um, kind of other East European countries. So that was a very important step that we, when we think of activism, we don't think about. It's first to translate some knowledge that can be useful for the movement and give definitions give terminologies to phenomenon and to the kind of activism you're doing. Uh, give you an example that the concept of gender, so-called gender English or in other Latin or Germanic languages, has to be first debated and then translated into Chinese because it's unclear how this should be translated. And there was a huge debate that um, should it be called social sex? in Chinese, because gender essentially depicts the social construction of our sex, right? But if you just call it sex, then it doesn't have that connotation. So then the theorists and translators, those feminists have to come up with huge lengthy debates on how to bring concepts to local contexts that make sense. So that's, I think, knowledge construction, uh, translating of concepts and use that process to also decolonize and to localize different knowledge. That's a key step. Um, then another uh, counter strategy, I think uh, that uh, 
I could ha I, I observed from Chinese feminist movement is learning to function in a different way that we're familiar with living or growing up in authoritarian context, meaning to organize actually in democratic ways and to not impose certain ideas onto your group members and to actually encourage uh, sharing and encourage kind of um, a collective ethos. And that's already difficult enough because uh, none of us knows how kind of elections should actually look like. Uh, that, that the fact you have never voted for anything. So uh, to create uh, non-authoritarian culture in your organization, that's already a big step and big challenge for many of them. And linking to this, I think to organize ourselves, be it feminist or environmentalist or workers union, uh, to be able to um, distribute the power to your members instead of kind of imitating or more, uh, using the same model that state has been using, which is a top-down and concentrated power model that you have only seen in your life. So to reinvent those structures, those ways of organizing, I think that's another important kind of strategies that people have to learn, uh, they have to create it. So those are the few points I want to mention. Thanks a lot. To you, Damir, please. Thank you. Well, just immediately two points from the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina, two things that hold the most emancipatory potentials are anti-fascism and anti-privatization. So anti-fascism in terms of the emancipatory moments that were produced starting from the workers' movements in 1920s and the, the first revolution that was actually um, very gendered because the workers around the Tuzla area stood up against, um, uh, as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, stood up against uh, uh, foreign workers, women being raped by the police. So that was the initial for, 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 the, first, for the first revolution of 1920s. Obviously, um, anti-fascist revolution of World War II as the greatest emancipatory potential with its integral part of anti-fascist front of women. Um, as as the the backbone of the um, of the emancipation and the creation of of of, of uh, socialist Yugoslavia, so anti-fascism, the legacy of anti-fascism, that kind of legacy of of anti-fascism that's very gendered, very um, very open and very vibrant in the context in which the neoliberal peace uh, is promoting anti-communist. Logic. So there is an onslaught of you know neoliberal um, peace building institutions with their idiotic practice of creating the multiculturalist apartheid uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where lives never intersect and people live um, next to each other. Hence, you have uh, um, schools divided by barbed wire in which uh, children of different ethnicities are divided and, and attend school like this. So this is what international community promotes as life. This was never life in Yugoslavia. So on, on one hand, you have to fight that. On the other hand, you have to fight the very long legacy of, um, you know, the war in Yugoslavia was, was exceptional in, in, in one point. It was like a very big exercise of the far right on how to fight. So, so you had the far rightists coming from Latin America, Australia, you had um, genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, was usually in, in the public discourse kind of reduced to ethnic hatreds, you know, Serbs against, against Muslims, but nobody's actually, actually thinking about how it was a big military exercise for the far right, how you can gather together large numbers of populations and execute them. So when you have Golden Dawn, Russian paramilitaries, where you have various other mercenaries participating in the executions and in the war, the war starts having a very different dimension and it needs to be thought in terms of the international um, mobilization of the far right. Rather than very myopic, very complacent thinking about ethnicity. So, 
So in terms of in terms of so these are the two potentials. So so one is the the the, the anti-fascism, vibrant and rich as it is, and the other one anti-privatization. And I'm going to give an example of uh, of the detergent factory in Tuzla, um, which kind of onset huge protest in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2014 that were that were called Bosnian Spring falsely, you know, thinking about the Arab Spring, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they were immediately criminalized because we were called Red Al Qaeda um, immediately afterwards. So but they, they held a, a huge potential because the workers fought against their factory being privatized. Their factory was once owned by them after the workers returned from the trenches, they were actually, they discovered that factories were, were sold to you know, foreign owners. They would usually, through voucher privatization, do the asset stripping of factories, leaving communities destitute and leaving actually huge toxic waste uh, to, to, to create these kind of zones, sacrificial zones and zones of exceptions where life cannot be nurtured. So um, workers did something amazing. They built a trench in front of the factory. And they said, if the police, if the riot police crosses this, there are 40 tons of flammable gas and the radius of 150 kilometers is going to get destroyed. So this kind of threat of violence is the only thing actually that produced the effect. With that, the workers themselves came up with something amazing. So they said, we are not using the regular trade union organizing principles. So they said, we are not on strike. We are in protest to maintain the production. So this phrase, to be in protest to maintain the production, has been an amazing kind of syntagm for, for, for artists, activists, and academics to think about what does it mean to, to, to be in protest to maintain the production? And what are we producing? How are we producing a different types of infrastructures, physical infrastructures, um, uh, affective infrastructures, cognitive infrastructures that have been completely, uh, completely depleted? So with these kinds of uh, factory occupation uh, came huge assemblies or called plenums where you know, several thousand citizens participated in the direct democracy after we ousted the government. And, um, and we actually had to defend the, the creativity of the violent acts of, 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 of ousting the government. Um, so um, the minute you start posing the questions of redistribution, you're going to get criminalized. This is the lesson. Like, you know, you can participate in, in this kind of idiocy of minor differences of identity politics and, you know, until the cows come home, you can be the, the completely um, kind of um, apathized subject of human rights in which the only role you have is to enumerate human rights violations against you, but there are no mechanisms actually to, to, uh, to um, address them or redress them. But actually, the only thing that, that, that worked was, was this mobilization of what's been useful for me to, to think about as unbribable life. So life that actually refuses to be bribed and to be bought off to accept social injustices and to become desensitized to the suffering of others. And this way, some sort of metaphoricity and the bond was created between women whose husbands are buried in unknown mass graves, workers who were destitute, LGBT communities and feminist scholars, uh, activists and artists who came together really to, to kind of defend, um, not, not the commons, because from the Yugoslav perspective, returning to the commons is very regressive, I mean, but really trying to think what anti-privatization moves mean for us as a society. Thank you. Um, there's too much to say about resistance. Uh, let me sort of, um, I think that there are two strands that I want to emphasize a great deal. 
One is a radical reimagination of the possibilities uh, of, of alternatives. And the second is uh, radical solidarities. And let me just try to illustrate in, in, in a few minutes. Um, radical reimagination, see, the, I think there are three kinds of crises that, that we are facing. Uh, and uh, the world we leave to our children will depend on how young people are able to resolve these crises or respond to them. The first of them is the crisis of inequality. Um, the second is the crisis of climate. And the third, uh, as I see it, is the crisis or the opportunity of living with difference. And, and how do we respond uh, with you know, more and more diverse communities? Uh, do we respond with hate, with fear, or we respond with, uh, with, uh, with friendship and curiosity and, and so on? Um, so in the crisis of inequality, uh, the reimagination that I am speaking about would be, uh, you know, the collapse of the Berlin Wall has been interpreted uh, across uh, neoliberal thinking that it marked the defeat of the ideas of justice and equality. And I think that we need to say it does not. Uh, uh, an experiment uh, to, to build a just and equal society uh, may have collapsed, but the ideas are as important and valid, but we have to find new pathways to it. And I think there isn't enough thinking about what those pathways are, universal social rights, taxing the rich, the elements that we are talking about, but I think we need far more uh, careful thinking about it. In, in terms of climate, again, I think that climate equity is not something that you can you know, add on to our climate strategies, but equity-based uh, uh, you know, thinking about how we prepare for future generations. But I'll spend just a little longer on, on the third because that's where much of my work is, uh, is, is focused. Um, how do we fight with uh, the, the rising politics of hate that we see across uh, in, in my own country, uh, but in many parts of the world? I think it's become more and more dangerous today to be a minority of any kind, anywhere, whether it's a minority of, of religion or ethnicity, uh, gender, language, and so on. And how do we create a world? Uh, and I think that there, the idea of radical solidarity to, to me is, is very critical. Uh, it is by standing together. Uh, it is by, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating that however much you want to divide us, uh, we stand together in, in our struggles. And, uh, and I even talk about radical love, um, love that is based on uh, enormous amount of courage. Um, and I, I'll give a very brief couple of examples. We had a whole spate of lynchings uh, in India, uh, very much reminiscent of uh, what happened to African Americans in, in the United States with crowds gathering, lynching people to death, and so on. And uh, there seemed to be no response. And uh, we made a call for a caravan of love, which we said we will resolve to go to every home anywhere in the country where somebody has been attacked with hate. And to do three, three or four things, to say that you're not alone, there are people who care. The second is that uh, we seek forgiveness for, for what has happened to you, what we've become. The third is we'll stand with you in your battles for justice. And the fourth is we will not, we will not ensure, allow your story to be silenced. And it, it was extraordinary how much impact this has had in, in, in changing. Uh, so I think that uh, the idea of radical solidarity is something that we need to understand and practice far more. We've had struggles, for instance, uh, India's citizenship laws were changed for the first time, uh, uh, discriminating against India's Muslims. And uh, unexpectedly, in universities across the country, and then uh, we had the largest movement uh, that we've seen after independence. But what was um, dramatic about that movement was Hindus, uh, the majority community, stood in very strong and visible solidarity with their Muslim brothers and sisters to resist this law. 
And, and, and I think that was the most powerful uh, form of resistance. And, and I think we need to think about that as well. Thank you. Sabrina, please. Great. Um, thank you. I've been thinking about a lot of things I've been saying uh, so far. I'm going to I'm going to pick up on the point of anti-fascism again because I think that's important. One of our jobs, like more recently, like the past five six years in society, is like trying to name these phenomena like around the far right. There's like is this fascist, neo-fascist, proto-fascist. There's like a bunch of prefixes that we're attaching to it. Um, is it almost fascist? Fascist tendencies and well, sometimes it gets into like a lot of like a lot of discussions and we haven't really seemed to like really agree uh, on what what is the right name for everything in that sense. But we should agree, let's say like, I'm not saying it's not an important task, it's an important task, but even more important than that is agreeing on anti-fascism. Because once we are building anti-fascism, we can actually build more critical mass to prevent proto bio fascist or whatever from um, actually rising and getting into power and doing all the damage that they plan on doing. And this was part of the struggle more recently in Brazil because um, well, not only in trying to understand what the Bolsonaro uh, phenomenon uh, is about, but in the sense that once he started you know, showing how bad he was, uh, a lot of people decided to say, well, well he's a fascist, so we're anti-fascist. And it kind of got depoliticized because also the anti-Bolsonaro was the same thing as being anti-fascist. And well, those of us who have been involved in anti-fascist struggles for a long time, we're saying, no, you have to name beyond this one person. So the job of naming is actually really hard because it's not just about the prefixes, it's also about naming a whole system and what we want to do with this. In the climate struggle, for example, this has been part of the, of the job, right? Because it's not enough to say there is a climate crisis. We need to pinpoint where it comes from. And when we do that, we need to say, well, maybe capitalism is part of this. And then we say, well, change, don't change the climate, change the system. What system is this? The system is capitalism. So this job of naming uh, is important because it's not just about the words, it's about uh, pinpointing the antagonists in this process, you know, trying to understand, you know, the actual power relations around it. And in that way, we are required to see that anti-fascism, even though it has this anti, that's always the negation of something, because it's the negation of something that you actually want to fight and bury, not have to be part of this cycle of how, how it comes back all the time, you are required to also start naming what you want instead. And this is a much more difficult job because it deals with imaginaries, it deals with our historical contradictions in trying to build an alternative. And um, it also deals with the fact that it's, since, we're, since there's a lot of depoliticization going around it, and since the far right captured a lot of this anti-systemic uh, sentiment, um, sometimes people don't wanna listen to us. Or sometimes, you know, they don't think we have the credibility, they're distrustful of what we say. And this is where solidarity comes in because solidarity is a way of like, it's, it's building a pathway into something a lot more powerful. And a great example that we had of this recently was, well, the landless workers movement in Brazil, very famous around the world because it's one of the largest social movements um, around today, but it has been criminalized for a really long time. You know, people in society who had never encountered a single landless person, you know, just like oh, they're terrorists, they're like really bad, they're invading, they're taking away our things. So like this, um, this association, right, with the elites, with the, with the land elites in Brazil, and this person doesn't even have land, but they're associating with it because they're afraid of the terrorists. So this criminalization is very powerful in terms of the discourse, but when people are going hungry, and we have been in this conference, uh, conference discussing the, the linkages between authoritarianism and food insecurity, and you know the and the fact that like people actually going hungry every day, when people are going hungry, who showed up? The landless workers movement. 
you know, producing good organic food, you know, through agroecological means and delivering tons of food and sometimes through other um, social movements as well, like the, the black movement in Brazil and the homeless workers movement and the eco-socialist movement, a lot of them coming together, showing up. And showing up is one of our best strategies to actually make sure the solidarity is not just about a banner saying that, yes, we stand with you and how this ends up captured sometimes as just like random hashtags that we find online. Showing up is about being there when people need you the most, even though they might not understand what you're doing, what the project is. And sometimes that's not, not the important part of it. It's about building the relationships. And I was thinking about this and looking at that one poster right there, the Jabasta one uh, in the beginning. And I think this is quite important because it kind of um, outlines this trajectory that we have, right? So Jabasta is like, that's enough. That's enough. And it's important to say that's enough. But a lot of people who are just like anti-Bolsonaro, anti-Trump or anti-AFD, it's like, yeah, this, 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 that's enough. And then you have to move into the, well, I'm done with this, but I, we need something else, just a negation. Uh, won't do it for us. And then, for example, there's the title of the Naomi Klein book, No, It's Not Enough. And this is a lot of the discussions that we also have, like uh, uh, talking about hegemony and counter hegemony. And so if we understand that we're negating this and we are showing up and people are fed up as well, now our job is to say, well, what do we want instead so we don't go back to this very situation here? And I think this is where we have a little bit of a deficit in terms of like our imaginary in the past decades, because for example, when we look into the World Social Forum, um, in Latin America, it had like a very strong context, for, especially in Brazil, Porto Alegre, a lot of people have even a little bit of a nostalgia around it. And, um, but one of the motos well, it was like a new word is possible. The problem of saying like that indefinite article here, a new word is possible is that far right also does it. A new word is possible. Our motto should actually be this, this new word is possible. This one that we're presenting to you right now. And this is our main challenge because yes, uh, there's a lot of fragmentation. Um, there is uh, a, a difficulty in actually dealing with these multiple crises at the same time because we're all so exhausted. And I think we have to acknowledge this. Everyone who's involved in you know, activism and organizing is absolutely exhausted. Uh, the, the spirit throughout the pandemic uh, made it much worse. So when we talk about the care crisis, we should be talking about the care crisis within our movements as well because there's a lot of people burning out. But I think one of the lessons here is that organizing is not a marathon, it's more like a relay race. You need to take turns. You have different capabilities, you have different talents, and you also have this possibility of, you know, understanding that rest and like taking care of yourself should be one of the values that we need to bring forward. And when we do that, this is also solidarity amongst us. It sets examples and it's a way of like building these new relationships that can go into the future. And maybe this is something that we can bring in when we're talking about, well, this is the new world that I think is possible where one that like you can also rest, you can also take care of each other. And in the sense, kind of going back to the discussion we had in the first panel, just to close it off, was that, you know, like if we're talking about the interregnum and this whole, um, this whole problem around, well, the, the old is dying, the new cannot yet be born, is that um, maybe, you know, these, this is the new that we want to be born. And so far, we have not been able to skip this interregnum because we left it way too open. So we have to be more specific in the way that we design our practices. And while we tell people that this is good and we're here for you and we're going to be building this together rather than just having a set formula. Yeah, I think we've moved to a really rich sense of showing up now through all your responses, like not showing up as making it to the street, but showing up for each other, like showing up, feeding people with good food on occupied from occupied land or showing up at the door of the morning people who has lo have lost someone. I mean, that's so powerful and, and showing up at the factory 
in order to maintain production. Like I, I think that's such a key um, turn of phrase. And also the showing up to like from the diaspora back to the people who like bring translate stuff, learn, create a form of life together. So I really think that that when you asked for what's the positive, like what how is it not just a counter strategy, that kind of showing up for each other, that's of course what like we want to build a socialist world on, right? That we more and more areas of life should be organized according to the principle of showing up for each other and having need oriented um, production. And I must say that I had a slight, like, I don't know, uh, hesitant, dark moment when you asked this question about the strategy. I was wondering a bit like, do you mean strategy to win? Or isn't it more that we're just talking about strategy to survive or at best to maintain the struggle at all, you know? Because I think sometimes that like, it if you do that, it's still not nothing. Like if they're like, whether you have any anti-fascism or not, like that's already a difference. And so I think this move to say we are in protest to maintain the production, that is something that one can also, that, that's of course a model of an active strike. So in one of the powerful movements that maybe are close to winning like Argentinian and broadly Latin American feminism, then there's also that model of the active strike, of the strike around reproductive labor, where you don't strike to halt production, but where you strike to have a different kind of production starting from the labor that preserves and maintains and reproduces life. So I think one way to say what the counter strategies to authoritarianism do, especially in a moment where authoritarianism intensifies and privatizes the capacity to, of death dealing or of destructive entitlement is to maintain, to protest, to maintain life, to protest, to maintain care infrastructures that are need oriented. And also, even though that sounds terribly conservative, the maintenance of this planet, like we might need, want a new world, but we want, we want the old planet, like, because we don't have another. And I think when we have to affirm that, that there is that switch, like let the right say my life, my rules. And then we now say, let's preserve the natural world we've got. And then my make it more alive. Of course, that's always possible, but stop um, producing, uh, um, destroying it. And so that would mean moving from the vocabulary of rights, which of course is totally rooted in that self-owning liberal individual that I think also is always a liminal figure very close to tipping into fascist propertized entitlement instead of that self-owning individual and the rhetorics of, of property and rights, you would more have a property of uh, uh, a rhetorics of life and of kind of shared. And I think there is a left-wing rhetorics of, of right life. And it's precisely that, that isn't prioritizing property. So the right-wing rhetorics of life is always enclosed life. It's always like life as it was objectified and propertized. The fetus that can't be aborted or the countryside that belongs to that group of people and not that, that that's kind of propertized life. But life and solidarity, I think that's, yeah, that, that's the base of, of anti-authoritarian struggles and yeah. May protest to maintain the production of life. Thank you for this incredibly rich uh, round. Um, I would like to ask you one last uh, quick question before we give, <laughs> before we, we, we open the um, mic, which has to do um, with something. Sabrina, for instance, just mentioned the question that um, the right, the far right, is also promising like uh, a new world. Um, and this has for me to do with the question of general of, of what's been discussed as the, um, our loss of the gesture of revolt. Yeah? Like the left has, <laughs> has been known for <laughs> revolting. And this has somehow been like monopolized um, by, by the far right. Um, and um, the question is like, what do you think we can like in a way offer to, um, to respond to what has been conceptualized at this um, like anger and resentment without an addressee? 
Uh, um, the question of uh, anxiety, the question of which has been capitalized by um, the far right um, as like a very as a, a completely reactionary and conservative revolt, which is without revolting to the actually dominant people, but revolting to the completely other side. So just um, and without order, any one of you who wants to share some insight on um, what you think if, um, if this even matters, if the idea, the gesture of revolt even matters, um, and how you would think we can um, work on it, like from the left. I won't talk, but I think uh, there might be a video that captures this perfectly. If we have time, we can watch it or play it um, out like when you guys are leaving. So it's a video made by a Chinese citizen to use humor, satire, and um, to ridiculize, to ridicule the situation, the ruler, as a way of revolt. In a situation where, where people can't go onto the street, where people can't organize themselves, they use digital media, multiple kind of visualized uh, material, and use that kind of um, sarcasm as a way to attack the state. I think that's, uh, sometimes that's the only choice, but sometimes it's also a very powerful choice. So i leave it to that. I'll be quick and say, you know, it's okay for us to be anxious. You know, we needn't be afraid of being anxious. I mean, anxiety tells us that we are alive still. Um, and in terms of that, um, you know, historically, uh, the far right and the far left have seemingly, on the referential level, the same articulation. But actually, and this is why we, we needn't be um, uh, afraid, because uh, the question that differentiates these two articulations that are seemingly the same on the referential level are on behalf of what kind of sociality are they uttered? And one is clearly uttered on behalf of equality, and the other isn't. Yeah, also just a couple of lines. I, I think that uh, one thing that we must must reflect on every time we resist is that uh, what the world that we want to build must be reflected in how how we resist. We can't say we want to build the most just and humane world by means that are unjust, cruel, uh, and so on. It's bound, and you know, recent history uh, in many parts will must. And, and therefore, uh, 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 if we are building uh, a world primarily on the idea of solidarity, uh, and uh, the idea of solidarity, Noam Chomsky actually said, the idea, it is the idea that we should take care of each other. Now, if that is the idea, that is the world we want to build, what is our forms of struggle at every step that reflect that value? And I don't think uh, I, I don't think there are easy answers to it, but uh, but we cannot accomplish a different world by means that mirror the world that we are fighting. Uh, we can't fight hate, for instance, with hate. Thank you. Um, I'll make just two very quick points here. Uh, one of the issues that we've had is that we know that many times when the left came into power, it demobilized the people. Um, not necessarily repressing revolt, sometimes yes, doing that, but sometimes just saying, no, we, you, there are other ways. So don't take it to the streets. Sometimes using the, the excuse um, that, well, if there's a lot of people in the streets that may destabilize this leftist progressive government, it might be easier for the right to come back. And I think one of the lessons that we have, like at least in the Brazilian case, is that demobilization did not help at all because there was a coup in the end anyway. So this has to be avoided at all costs. A left should be mobilizing from every stance and the movements that outside of the institutional power have the duty to uh, keep it to the streets uh, and keep it to occupations and building community kitchens and other forms of collective living that are not necessarily just in the format of like the protest, right? Uh, but 
this also means that it has to be an ongoing task, and this is what Marta Harnecker, you know, late Chilean thinking, like really amazing, um, used to say that one of the problems is that we have kind of got adjusted to responding to the calendar of the right to the capitalists. So they come, they attack us. And so for example, right now in the United States, the struggle for reproductive rights, because while well, everyone's taking now to the streets to say, yes, we need to you know, defend the right uh, to abortion, like safe, secure abortion, funded publicly. But for a while they kind of said, well, this is not, a, we already secured this, right? Going back to the problem with rights, right? We already secured this, we don't need to mobilize anymore. And so when we get very used to this calendar that they're setting for us, not only are they getting the whole, uh, the whole system of thinking around revolt with them, they're also kind of controlling when we set it off, right? So it's like they're pressing this button and now, you know, the, the, the anti-capitalists and the leftists, they're going to revolt. You know, we're going to stop pressing the button now, they'll go back to their houses. So we need to find a way to keep uh, struggles going in a way that we can build our own calendars and we can set our own agendas. <laughs> For one thing, I think that also revolt has been part of the um, right-wing protest repertoire for a long time, if you think of Saalstürmung in the 30s or something. And as far as I'm concerned, they can have it. So revolt and also certain from way versions of the term mobilization are actually quite a narrow and really masculinist and ableist concept of doing politics. I think it's never been good for the left as much fun as revolting, of course, can sometimes be, right? I'm all for it. But if you um, collapse poli left politics into revolting, you have a far too narrow politics. And you also don't even understand the successful moments of revolt. Like something like the storming of the barricades also needed a lot of surrounding um, practices and organizing to be successful and memorable. So, yeah, I think organizing and, again, maintaining the production of life maybe in a solidarity um, informed way, then that's like, if the right takes that from us, then we've won because then they're not right anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. So I would like to invite uh, you all for not only like Q&A, but also like for your reflections and for sharing um, your thoughts. Um, at some point, if it gets too long, I will like have put a very strict look on my face and take the microphone. <laughs> but um, no, really um, feel really free, free to share your thoughts. So, thank you, thank you so much. I'm really fascinated by the Chinese example, actually. But I'm going to ask one thing about like, and then maybe this will connect to uh, the German case in a sense. Because you know Darren Byler is also like talking about Chinese uh, this kind of authoritarian measures and how they are actually using this digital surveillance uh, to establish like absolute control over life, and then you know that he makes a really that's why he calls it like terror capitalism, no, not even surveillance capitalism. There's this kind of um, there's something else there, and then he thinks this is the configuration of like a new configuration of political economy because private actors, non-state actors are involved in this kind of authoritarian uh, forging for profit, in a sense. You know, as, as we see that normally, we, when we think, think about authoritarianism, we think that state is taking the lead for absolute control. But nowadays, we see market forces dragging the state alongside them for you know, the you know, different dystopian future, almost. And then what do you think of this, in a sense? Can we think of Chinese state taking a new, radically different form? Uh, is it going to be like, you know, the, is it the new modality of neoliberalism or is it something else? And then this connects almost like, you know, the, I'm also working with far right groups and that's why it's completely similar. But there is well, the same thing is also like, you know, the, not, you know the, there's an Amazon warehouse and then there's like unnecessary uh, highway almost being constructed. And also like, you know, when you consider the social media law in Germany, now it gives the state powers to private companies. No? And in order to avoid fines, they have to act as if they are the state or the court. So there is this kind of leaking almost between these two cases. And of course, Germany is generally put in opposition, in antagonism to Chinese system, you not know, just like more open and like rights are guaranteed. But there is this kind of, you know, the something is coming almost. So there's this kind of, again, uh, private actors are involved for like more authoritarian, more surveillance systems 
What would you say about the similarities between the two, maybe? Thank you. We collect some of your remarks, okay? Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this panel. It was amazing and very inspiring and very touching in all kinds of ways. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, that I could witness to all these uh, uh, presentations. And secondly, my question will be a sort of maybe a little bit provocative, but uh, maybe also an, a good exercise for the times that we live in. So somehow in connection with the panel, uh, 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 the feminist panel yesterday, I would like to, to very simple question. Do you think that today's anti-fascism uh, somehow has to be feminist? And if, if yes, if not, how do you see it basically? Like if you could relate to this kind of short, uh, uh, um, a statement because I believe that today and also it was very visible in your all of your presentations actually that somehow feminism has reshaped anti-fascism but also more generally political you know our ways of doing politics so I'm curious you know um, about your thoughts on that topic and thank you very much again for for this panel and also for these conferences we are slowly you know, finishing it thanks so much Yes, um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it a lot. It was very, very so provoking, I think so. Um, you know, we, we are talking about utopias and about, you know, the possibility that go beyond uh, authoritarianism. And I think that when we think of utopia, also we think of the idea of freedom, of be free, you know. But today it seems to be that the idea of freedom is more, has been captured, has been caught by the far right, also by the, so you say you know, my life, my, my, my life, my rights, and, 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 and a slogan of, of the far right. And after the COVID you know, pandemic, the idea of freedom has been related to also with the far right movement, so the COVID denialists and so on. But it's also the case that the idea of freedom is maybe one of the most appealing ideas or political appealing ideas today. You know, like the people don't believe, for, I don't know, I come from Argentina, so democracy do doesn't change anything. Uh, justice is like a justice corruption because the judiciary is corrupted or the idea is equality. So many, 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 many people, you know, they believe of the idea of equality as, a, as, as, as something good. You know, like many people. But the idea of freedom, so the, the very idea of freedom is still be appealing. So it's, you know, like it's, I think that maybe, and, and I think that uh, from the left, the left, some kind has lost the idea of freedom or the defense of freedom. And what kind of freedom or, 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 or what do you think that should be the role of the idea of freedom or what kind of freedom we do, we, do we need to think of uh, concrete utopias? Or what kind of freedoms or maybe, do we need that idea? So after all, I don't know. Uh, I just have a quick question. Maybe you could comment on the um, on the class relations of um, authoritarianism because it's like I myself have. Uh, problems formulating or like I have like, there is some kind of specific relations of, of class and state or like capitalist class and state cooperation in, in authoritarianism but I myself have big difficulties formulating it which I think is a bit founded in the notion that from leftist critique the liberal democracy is already acting in the complete interest of the capitalist class or like completely in their like as their arms and eyes and hands and so now like I'm lacking the like the the words to really formulate what this kind of relationship of the capitalist class and the authoritarian state is. Um, so if you could comment on that, I would be very thankful, and I would be happy to because I don't want to take a question away um, of someone else. So maybe we can do another one. Quotierung, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, um, I uh, also thank you um, for those uh, for your for your statements and for your thoughts. Um, I'm really sad that I missed the rest of the conference. So maybe what I'm gonna ask is uh, touching on things that have already been brought up. Um, 
yeah, lots of thoughts and questions. I'll narrow it down uh, on to two um, that refer to something that uh, you, Damir, said. And um, first, I think you mentioned uh, something like um, strategies that are kind of um, like states of uh, former Yugoslavia being like a laboratory f um, to uh, to test or like to try out um, uh, strategies. Um, yeah, well, to create like the conditions that are needed for um, for like a capitalist um, um, economy and 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 politic. And uh, I think that's very interesting because I I think that's that needs like necessarily is happening all the time that um, uh, like those spheres um, have to be commodified or um, whatsoever and create a, like a certain form of consciousness maybe. And, and uh, I wanted to ask if you can elaborate on that a little bit. And um, the second question touches on this triangle. I think you, um, you were talking about of uh, insecurity, poverty, and uh, trauma, and uh, this sounds um, intuitively very uh, convincing to me, and it sounds very like uh, solid or firm, and um, well, I guess probably especially as a psychoanalyst, but but I mean it, it doesn't not necessarily not necessarily just about the trauma aspect of it, but like. Are there um, are there any kind of strategies or uh, specific moments where this um, stability maybe can can become uh, yeah um, well uh, irritated maybe I'll be quick. Uh, one sentence to Eva's question. Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, I think all fam all movements should be feminist. If there is a lack of reflection of gender inequality in your movement, then there's something missing. So I don't see any doubt in that. And to answer the first, uh, to respond to your comment, I think it's a brilliant uh, uh, case or kind of uh, phenomenon you have, you have pointed at, and which is a very good reminder for all of us that when we think of an authoritarian regime, meaning when the authoritarian leader is actually in power, we often think that's state actors, or well, that's public actors, that's the government. But it's also important to point out how much they have co-opted the whole private sector and the economy that, that makes citizens depend on them. And that's the case um, in China that in the 90s and beginning of 21st century, Scholars and analysts are really expecting the growing middle class would liberalize China. They would demand a revolution or reform that demand for like you know uh, improvement or uh, change of regime. It didn't happen because most middle class have gained their wealth from the real estate sector that has been, of course, uh, given, granted by the state, and their jobs are related to state or they have to co collaborate with the state. And the phenomenon you're mentioning, the so-called digital uh, authoritarianism, is uh, a good example of how the state has been not only sec secularized, um, I mean, securitized, I mean, made security a kind of, um, a, like, um, ubiquitous uh, in the public debate, but also outsourced that uh, security business to many companies. So she has launched this campaign that uh, all companies and state institutions should pay a lot of attention to their security level. That has boosted a large wave of private companies creating uh, anti-surveillance uh, kind of equipment or classifying like um, a protocol for checking whether your company has met that security level. In a way, it's business, and the state has somehow a kind of hit two birds with one stone. They both raised the issue or broadened the, the use of digital surveillance in the society. They have also co-opted more citizens to work on it. So I think it's a great example to show how authoritarianism often doesn't work within state, but it works really across the boundary of state and society and private and pu public. Um, 
And you asked me what could be the alternative of the Chinese state. I think that has been uh, has disappointed many observers of China that they have been expecting um, the de democratization of China, especially given there has been quite a liberal period uh, throughout the 80s and later also in early the first decade of 21st century. It didn't happen because the thing with authoritarian regime is that it's not like it's not that it, they don't bring progress. Actually, they bring a lot of improvement of many things, and they also start to open up. They also actually use democratic uh, measurements in their governance. They listen to people's views. But the thing is, it's not stable. And any kind of shock can immediately close up all pockets of like um, liberties, and civil society will be immediately shut down overnight. And that's exactly what's happening in Xi's era, is that um, that crisis has somehow triggered the regime to really tighten up the control. Um, and of course, I think history is kind of spiral. Uh, it goes in a spiral way that I'm sure we will see China, or regimes like China, to gradually relax and maybe liberalize a bit again in the following decades. And one day it will have another shock. So I think it's um, something to, to be observed. Okay, I'll just pick up on this. Uh, I immediately like the word irritated, you know, how to irritate this triad. And I was wondering, so why do I like it so much? And because, you know, etymologically it has, it has the roots into, into exciting or provoking, as in, as in calling forth something that doesn't exist there anymore. So insecurity, poverty, trauma kind of takes hold over life and death and and why, why, why that's important for instance and how to irritate it how to irritate it it means how to liberate people from the hold of that for instance in case in case of the regimes of 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 governance through trauma through it, the attendant commemorative practices or transitional justice mechanisms as they are kind of imposed by the international community it actually means developing not privatized or ethnicized um, practice of talking about loss. It means actually talking about loss as properly social. So for instance, I mean, I, I used to work with the, um, with a lot of families of the missing people. I, I worked on, uh, on, on mass graves, particularly clandestine mass graves. And it all, you know, kind of led me to think, so why are these graves hidden and why are those people who hid them actually in power installed by the international community who know where the locations of these mass graves are so they're there kind of as a golden investment of these elites kind of to keep being in power right um, and also then the remains from these mass graves are completely reappropriated by ethno-nationalist projects and they are buried and um, kind of stamped religiously as ethnic um, loss. And the problem with that is that in this kind of neoliberal peace, the neoliberal peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina perpetuates the logic of the gaze of the perpetrator of the, of the crime. Because only in the, in, the, in the logic of the perpetrator of the, of the crime, the other had to be hallucinated as the ethnic other and then execute it, right? So it also then means to, to how do you kind of actually intervene into the constant insecurity? Open any newspaper, to, like yesterday, Bosnia and Herzegovina is going to be the next target of cyber attack by Russia um, uh, or and Georgia as well. So Russian influences, um, a, a lot of fear being constantly separation is, you know, is is Serbia going to invade supported by Russia etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, you know it is it's been a fantastic lab Bosnia and, you know not only because it enabled Clinton to develop this kind of muscle diplomacy as it has and you know later on Bosnia and Herzegovina is going to be used um, you know to, to to think about bombing of Libya to think about interventions in Syria but also to think about, you know, and then, then Bosnian labor going to, to actually work for American military because they have learned how to service the American wars and then become these 
in post-Fordist authoritarian regimes, very good kind of labor subjects. But also there is another export industry by, by Bosnian labor in addition to medical industry, and that's forensic science. Kind of, you know, because <laughs> Bosnians are well trained into putting together the remains, right? So I think I think it's 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 really interesting then 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 to think about uh, w what are the possibilities of intervening. So how do you move people from a victimized positions to understanding that they have survived? And for us, it's meant through various practices of activism. Academia also, the knowledge production, you know, you talked about it. I mean, you know, in addition to all of these international regimes of governance um, that, are, that are being um, kind of perpetuated in Bosnia and Herzegovina, thinking about it, the International Office of Migration is maintaining camps for migrants. It is, uh, uh, there are transitional justice organizations carrying out um, these kind of commemorative practices, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all non-state actors that are international actors kind of, you know, intervening into the polity. Um, it is important for us to start thinking about how we've, after the war, we stopped counting the losses and we actually started counting the gains. So all life that has survived is amazing for us because the wartime logic continues. So. It is not only human waste that was produced and then buried in unknown mass graves, right? That then communities would be silent about for 15 years. And then all of a sudden they would say, there is this awful smell, our water is contaminated. And they knew all the time that actually mass graves containing several thousand people are there. So it is this kind of the logical waste that is now continuing you know, no, from the war all the way now to, to, to kind of uh, chemical waste being left and abandoned. So there is no discontinuity. There is only the continuity of the production of war and human waste and the necessity to identify yourself as, 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 as wasted, as being worth for nothing. And in this kind of, and th 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 this is what's interesting um, uh, because on the Argentinian case, um, we, we heard that how anxiety and depressions are kind of monetized, but actually, and this is the, the problem of survival, and this is the, the, the promotion by the international community of the resilience. Like, you know, but whenever I hear resilience, that I don't have hair, but my hair would be raising, right? So it, by actually being resilient, you are being actually trained to withstand the impacts of the, of the market, right? And you have to ha develop this kind of plasticity, right? So. Against this, I mean, it's like capital has found a way, and I, the, on the Bosnian example, is to, in this survival, survival entails dying and then being able to survive. So what is monetized is this kind of interval of dying and then coming through. And this is, th th this is what's so fascinating, what's so scary about contemporary kind of monetization practices. Uh, yes, anti-fascism, uh, there is no such a thing as, as a non-feminist anti-fascism. <laughs> Thank you, Damien. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, uh, um, very rich question. So let me sort of say, firstly, yes, uh, um, all progressive movements uh, being informed by feminism, it fills us, you know, many gaps that we had in our practice in the past. There are many reminders and uh, it is central. Um, could pick up on other questions, but I just wanted to respond uh, to your question. Is freedom at the center of our, we're calling it utopia, I think our imagined future because uh, it's, not a, it's not a utopia, it's something that we believe is possible and we will uh, accomplish it. I think freedom is very important a very important part of it. But if I had to choose one center, I would really choose solidarity. I, I could have used the word fraternity. Uh, I recognize the problems with the word. Uh, uh, it, it excludes sisterhood and, and, and many other things. But in, 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 in the Indian constitution, actually uh, the Hindi word is, uh, is, is bandhuta uh, for fraternity. 
And it's a lovely word because it really means ultimately that we are bound to and with each other. And that notion uh, that we are bound to, so injustice to you is injustice to me. If you suffer, uh, I suffer with you. Uh, that idea is very central, I think. Uh, and if, if something is most fundamental, uh, when, when in the writing of our constitution and in the, why the argument that fraternity was, was really the most, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity. Justice, liberty, and equality are possible without fraternity, but only with the power of the state. If there is fraternity uh, or bandhuta uh, or solidarity, then justice, liberty, and equality become the natural order of things and doesn't require enforcement by the power of the state. And to that extent, it becomes the most fundamental to our imagination of a better future. I agree that solidarity has to go together. I, I don't think like, um we should give up on the word. I, I, I'm, I don't like giving up on words. I like just like trying to attach other meanings to it and make sure that they come together and we build a context, right? So a context where freedom is attached to solidarity. I really like the word emancipation because it kind of, and we had this discussion in one of the panels uh, earlier this week as well, because I'm not a linguist, so probably it doesn't make any sense what I'm gonna say here, but emancipation to me kind of implies some movement. So like when I talk about emancipation, I think of the movement of emancipating and um, and freedom sometimes sounds a little static to me, like a motto that's there. So I like to put them together. But I wanna take the, the point on, yes, I think we all agree on the whole thing uh, on anti-fascism uh, having to be uh, feminist, but the praxis is very different. And I think we need to stress this. There is a lot of resistance in uh, anti-fascist movements and in the left that proclaims itself as anti-fascist to uh, embedding feminist praxis uh, within our spaces. So the way that we organize ourselves, our assemblies, uh, who we will in include in our spaces. So for example, uh, because Eva mentioned the problem like masculinist and ableist practices, like we've had a lot of fights over the years on like having to, uh, we have our meetings and there are no spaces for children. And if there are no spaces for children, there are no spa spaces for mothers. So this is one of the things. Or like, oh, let's have a meeting and there are only stairs. So like we are excluding people who have uh, certain physical disabilities. And when we complain about these things, it's like, yeah, but we're already doing so much. This is not the priority. So feminism, if we're actually going to take it very seriously within the anti-fascist movement, it has to be about shifting some of the priorities. And this is going to be something that in the end, everyone will, when? Because it opens up horizons, so it emancipates in that sense. But at first, it's going to look like some people are going to have to lose because they're, they're going to have to lose some spaces, uh, some of their like very strict ideas on how we do things. Um, this notion that anti-fascism is like, you know, just like, oh, it's, uh, I'm gonna punch the fascist or something like that, but then you don't have anything to offer. And one thing, like actually like the past years in Brazil, a lot of these people who are online saying that I'm gonna punch the fascist, never punch the fascist, <laughs> never, right? But they always claiming and like, yeah, and, 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 and always in a very masculine sense. So this is something that we really, really have to tackle. But on the thing on the class relations of authoritarianism, uh, that that I think are, are really important, uh, what Aurel uh, mentioned, is that for us, at least, uh, it was quite clear for us that this is a matter of crisis, right? Liberal democracy manages the, the relationship between the state and the capitalist class pretty well under normal times. When, when there's a crisis, um, the capitalist class wants things a lot faster and they want certain, a um, little bit of an insurance that things are going to go that way. And this is why it's easier to, you know, let, let's access these more authoritarian practices, uh, practices. So in that sense, you know, we're not gonna lose or we're going to gain a few things that we kind of had to give up on in these liberal negotiations in the past. So um, I'm gonna end here, yeah. Um, so on Aurel's question, why does the capitalist class need authoritarianism given how well liberal um, um, rulers do the work for them? I think you need authoritarianism when you want to split the working population in a new way 
and when you want to make something extractable that wasn't extractable before, so kind of the, I would call it, propertizing violence. Mm, I think that the, the discussion about the platforms and Amazon and anti-fascism would be too detailed and long, but one thing I want to say on that is that the Frankfurt School theory of, of authoritarianism, right, they stressed very much the situation or the stage of capitalism as monopoly capitalism, but monopoly of market share. And now we have a different configuration where we have monopoly in markets by certain platforms. And I think that that's something we need to like really think through um, for the current conjuncture. Um, um, on the anti-fascist feminism, because of course I also agree, I maybe just want to make the footnote that of course, feminism, unfortunately, isn't, I mean, in this room, for sure it is, but in its, it's not automatically anti-fascist itself. So we need the right kind of feminism. And especially in Germany, we have a sort of self-proclaimed feminism that is homonational, trans-excluding, and like Muslim-phobic and just horrible. So not that um, feminism. And freedom, yeah, I think we should totally stick to the notion of freedom and of course, like there's a long left tradition of thinking freedom are based on solidarity and I also think at this moment we need something like a horizon of freedom as the abundance of time, like not conquering space, but actually having time and lifetime and flourishing. That was a very good last point <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, we would be like right on time, but I would very much like to hear one more round of uh, your comments, uh, if that is okay. Comments, not questions, so that we close like in I, I 10 minutes more. around. <laughs> if you wish to, if you have them, of course. If you all feel that it's a good moment to go home, I would. I just. Can I? Can I ask a question? Is it fine? Can I ask a question? Okay, uh, uh, my question is to Damir, actually. Uh, you know, like, looking at the Indian situation, Harsh, you talked about there is hope in, uh, you know, of course, the Hindu-Muslim, just like race, it's like a fiction, but people will be killed for that fiction of different set of people. Uh, but, you know, for example, if you look at even solidarity, what happened after the anti-CA protests, for example, uh, Natasha, the middle-class Hindu population who stood with it, you pay different costs, whereas some Somebody like Gulshifa Fatima is still under arrest and, you know, Omar Khalid, you don't know when he's going to come out. So in even very conservative scholars of violence like Ashutosh Vashne say, there is going to be a large scale program in India and that will happen. And, and you know, even to resist it might be increasing violence. There is no point of uh, getting the Muslims together because that will just increase the violence and create an army. So that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Damir coming to you like death, like as like a certainty and then survive. So can we learn any lessons from the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, if it is possible, to look at a different situation, which could become a little similar, though exactly the same? Yes. I mean, the, the only lesson that I can extract from Bosnia and Herzegovina is that, that internationally genocide pays. And that, that is a horrible lesson to, 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 to draw. And uh, the second lesson that, 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 that the workers protest um, have, have taught me is that um, you have to defend the right onto your life to fire back when you're fired upon. So, and I think this is this has been kind of you know very clear. I mean, you know, those of us who've survived the war, um, when when the police brutality uh, and the onslaught of the international actors against social protests that demanded social justice, that essentially demanded very simple thing, that people wouldn't be left without being paid for 35 months. You know, or for instance, you know, th th there are these practices, in, like particularly in Serbia, when, when, you know, like South Korean owner forces people to wear diapers so in order to be more productive um, and not to go to the toilet, right? Um, uh, or for instance, when dogs are released uh, onto, onto the protesters, right? Uh, th th there is a clear line. Those of us who have survived the war 
who has the right to attack us any longer, right? It's, it's, it, it, is, it is actually an absolute and utter right to fight back. And, you know, I'll just end with, with Boris Budin has a fantastic formulation and this regards the freedom. You know, people are not responsible for the freedom that was taken away from them, but they are responsible for the unfreedom against which they failed to stand. I don't see any hands in the air and I feel that it's a very good moment to close this beautiful panel. Thank you so much to all of you. This is okay. Thank you.